much paying attention to me. I'm going to leave now. Bye. Well, good morning, 1012 Church. Thank you all for coming in. Um, we're going to go ahead and already start to prepare to give for our offering this morning. Our ushers are going to bring our buckets up in just a moment. If you need an offering envelope, please raise your hand and they'll bring you one. Excellent. All right. I've got a couple announcements just to remind you of that we had last week. Um, if you can all please pull out your bulletins. Just do it now? Okay. All right. First, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of our kiddos. So we're going to dismiss our kids at this moment. Uh, if you could just head on over there. I think my lovely wife Nina's back there as well as... I'm totally blind right now. I can't tell who else is over there. Melanie. Melanie, okay. Have a good one. All right, now that's a little bit more quiet. Uh, we're going to have a couple more announcements for you. Uh, just pull out your bulletins if you haven't written these dates down last week. Uh, if you can see, we're going to have a men's breakfast uh, January 28th at Steve's house. We should have a little sign-up sheet for you next week just so we can keep tabs on how many men are coming. So if you're interested, look out for that. January 29th, immediately after service, we're going to have one of our famous E3 fellowships. That's where everyone comes, everyone brings something to eat, and everyone eats. Oh, wait, they also fellowship here. It's in there somewhere. Um, they're really fun. It's just a big potluck. Uh, don't all just bring dessert. I mean, as good as that would and as awesome as that would be, we don't need a bunch of dessert. What? No brisket? No. Brisket can be there. There's, if brisket's an option, bring brisket. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with five types of brisket. All right? I will, There's nothing wrong with that. I will go there and say it. You can bring as much dessert as long as there's brisket. We're good. All right. And then during service, this is what I had to clarify. We're going to have a message focused on small groups, correct? And you'll actually have a sign-up for it? Just a sign-up. So during service, at one point, you're going to be told to... Get up and sign up, right? Is that how it goes? No. <laughs> You're going to have an opportunity to sign up. By opportunity, it means we're going to like put something in your face and say sign up. Basically. All right, there we go. I got that one right. We're good. All right. Um, and uh, I'll let Steve clarify that in a little bit during his message, just so that you can have more information on that, because I clearly don't have it. Um. That's what I got for you guys today as far as our announcements goes. If you have any questions, you can approach one of us at the welcome table after service, and we can get more information for you. Other than that, at this moment, we're going to prepare to give. So if you wouldn't mind standing on your feet one more time, we're going to pray over our offering. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for this day. Lord, I just ask that you just bless those that are giving right now for your kingdom and for your cause, Lord, and for your to be obedient. And Lord, I just ask that you just bless this rest of this week. Um, help those that are struggling wherever they need, even if it's in financial needs, Lord, just help them to give that to you and just bless them abundantly for it, Father. Lord, I just ask that we use this offering wisely here at 1012 Church to further your kingdom and to further your cause, Lord, and not our own. We just thank you so much. I ask that you just make our hearts and minds receptive to your word today, Lord. And help us to just see you in everything we do. And we pray these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. All right, at this time, you guys can come to give, and we're going to have a couple of videos for you really quick. <laughs> I think I have a pretty good grasp of the Bible and uh, how I teach it to my Sunday school class. Granted, I've been asked to step down a few times, but I mean, heresy is such a loose term these days. But I think if you put all the jigsaw pieces of the puzzle of the Bible together, I think I have a pretty good idea to teach anybody a little thing or two. Okay, so uh, share some of your knowledge with us. Okay, no problem on that one. Um...
First of all, I want to welcome everybody that's here. Also, we are live on YouTube now, so if you are tuning in for the first time uh, via the internet, I want to welcome you as well. This is a very important day today because um, not only do I want to welcome those that are here um, and online, this message is going to be archived for the next several months, maybe even a year, and is going to be given to many people that start going through a discipleship process that we are kind of launching today. So if you are actually listening to my voice in the future here, I want to encourage you to start, not only start this process, but continue forward with it uh, with all of your heart. We believe that this is the most important decision that you can make in your entire life, and that is your decision to live for God. We have a, some competition with rain noise this morning, so uh, we're going to work around that as best as we can. Jam, uh, Jim might have to turn me up a little bit. Everybody say praise God. Praise God. That's right. All right. So, man, that's loud. All right, Lord, we need you to let up on this a little bit. Last week, um, I casted some vision of this discipleship program. I've been under a sabbatical for the last several uh, months preparing for this. Today, hopefully, when you walked in, you received an outline. Everybody get your outline? Good, because you're going to need a pen today because we've got a lot of stuff to cover. This is going to be the first lesson in a series of lessons that we're going to be doing. Um, and it's got a lot of fill in the blanks. Um, on the screen here in a minute, you're going to see all these points come up, and there's going to be spots for you to fill in those. So I would encourage you to grab a pen to participate in this, and uh, let's just take off today. I'm going to be doing some teaching today, which is a little bit different than my typical preaching style, but... If you have received this resource in your hands and you're listening to my voice, I want to just congratulate you because if you receive this resource and it's found your way into your hands, into your hands, then that means that you have recently decided to follow Christ. This may be your first time or your first decision, or this may be a rededication of your life, but either way, we believe that you have made the most important decision of your life. So what does it mean to follow Christ? And why is that one decision so important? How will it actually affect my life? And what do I do now? These are all questions that we intend to address over the next uh, several lessons. And hopefully give you a clear picture of what it means to be a follower of Christ. So let's start at the beginning. I want to just step aside and tell you that with this first lesson, my goal is to show you a bridge between how God pursues his people. And people a lot of times always say to other people, it's your relationship with God that matters. How many have heard that? That God wants a relationship with you, and it's a relationship with him that matters. But really, what does that mean? And and and. And, and how is it that we can have a relationship with God? And why does God even want a relationship with us to begin with? So my goal today is to kind of bridge this gap between the very beginning of the Bible and where we are currently in history and how God relentlessly pursued a relationship with us. So start off with number one. We learn in the beginning of Scripture that God created everything in, seven day, in six days and then rested on the seventh day. But above everything that God created, mankind was and is today his most valued creation for two reasons. It's his most valued creation. Leave that up, uh, Nina. This is mo I mean, sorry, Josh. As far as we get going again, wait for me to move forward. I don't want you to move forward ahead of me, please. We are his most valued creation. I want you to think about the word valued because a lot of times what we do is we assign value to a possession, okay? 
we, uh, we say our house is probably one of the most valuable things that we own or we're paying for. We don't really own it yet. We're paying for it. Probably right next to that would be our vehicles or whatever. So when we assign value to things, we automatically place um, some type of possession as being valuable. But God said that, that, that we are valuable. Think about it like this. There are things that can be so valuable that they don't even have a price tag attached to them. And a lot of times it's the relationships in your life that are the most valuable thing that you can have. The relationship with your son or your daughter, the relationship with your husband, the relationship with your sister or your brother, or the relationship with your mom or dad. Think about how valuable those relationships are and, 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 and what would be the price that you would put on that. You couldn't assign a price to them because they're so valuable. I want to tell you that God sees us the same way. Uh, like my son, I love, I cannot express to you how much I love my son. And the truth is, is that I would give my life for him. So there, there can never be a value that can be placed on that relationship. So whenever I say that God loves us so much that we are his most valued creation, I go as far as to tell you that there is no price on, the, on that relationship that God desires for you to have with him. It is the most valued thing that he's, he's ever done, and you are his most valued creation. So for two reasons, A... We were created in the image of God. In other words, we are similar to God in many ways. We have been given authority over the animals. We have been given the power to create things. And most importantly, we have the unique ability to reason and weigh options. We have the unique ability to reason and weigh options. That's something that's different than anything that God's created before in the past. B, we were created with a free will. We were created with a free will. We have the capability to will something done, then do it. Regardless of if it's good or bad, if it is something that we will do, most of the time, we do it. Just look at what God, just look at what man has accomplished over the last 100 years. Y'all stop smiling. This ain't funny. Every time the rain picks up, I see y'all like, I'm like, yeah, I know. This is not funny. But we're different than all of God's creation. He gave us free will. So number two. With free will, though, comes choices. The two major choices that Adam and Eve faced are the exact same choices that we face today. Do we obey God? Or do we... Or do what we want to do? Let me read that again. Do we obey God or do what we want to do? Or maybe I should say it like this. What will we do with free will? In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. A lot of times you don't hear that. A lot of times you hear about the one tree that was eaten from, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but there were two trees there. There was a choice. God, from the beginning, gave Adam and Eve choices. In the Garden, there were two trees. One was the tree of life, and the other one was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of life was, was free game. They could eat from that anytime they wanted to. In fact, the, the tree of life sustained the life of Adam and Eve. The other tree was off limits, and eating from it came with consequences. Similar to how life is today. Number three, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would bring sin, would be a sin, and the consequence was death. I want you to take note that this was the first law that God create, established. And it was established way back in the beginning. And it was the law of sin and death. 
And believe me, it's still active in the world today. Adam and Eve had a choice to obey God or to live in the garden in the presence of God or to sin against God and be banished from the garden forever. This is the same decision that we face today about eternity. But the consequences of sin are different because of Jesus. Now we'll dive into what Jesus did as we progress a little bit into this lesson. But as you can see, we, we, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. Because there's so much from the very moment that Adam and Eve was created that we still deal with today. So let's go to number four. And most of you know this, but Satan, he's a crafty dude, man. He's crafty and he always takes whatever God said and he twists it. That's his most famous thing that he ever does. He loves to take that which God said and twist it to confuse you and to deceive you. His ways are deceitful frequently tricking people into thinking that they can do whatever they will or whatever they want with little to no consequences. Satan has always been around and he makes bad choices look good. He did this in the Garden of Eden and he's still at work today. It's like, oh, what, what, wait a minute, God said you couldn't eat this fruit? wait a minute, did God really say that you couldn't eat it or did he just, because you know if you eat it, you would be more like God. Satan twists things and he's deceitful. So number five, Adam and Eve were deceived by Satan and ate the forbidden fruit, but afterward they felt ashamed. They tried to cover up their shame by putting fig leaves on. Up until this point, Adam and Eve didn't even know they were naked. And look at what God does. Even though they, they disobeyed one of God's direct orders. God, was, God graciously made them close. But he also let something play out. And I want you to get this because this still happens today. God graciously made them close. But then he cursed the woman in childbirth with pain. And he also cursed the ground causing the man to work all the rest of his days. We, too, make stupid decisions and feel ashamed, like Adam and Eve. And we regularly try to cover them up. That's one of the first things that we do when we, when we do stupid things. We regularly do stupid things, but then the first thing we do is try to, try to cover it up. It's so funny because Adam, whenever God came to Adam, he blamed the woman. In fact, whenever he blamed the woman, he said, it was the woman that you put in the garden. So he not only blamed the woman, but he blamed God for putting the woman in the garden. That's just like what we do. We often try to cover up our mistakes, and then we turn around and blame. But let me tell you something. God graciously, and this is exactly what happens today, God graciously forgives us. But I want you to get this. He allows the curse of our decisions to play out. He allows our bad decisions that we make. Even though he will forgive our sins, a lot of times he'll let those things play out in our life. i give you example after example after example of things that I did that were stupid. And even though I know that I stand here today forgiven, that I had to deal with the consequences of those stupid things that I did and it cost me sometimes a lot of money and court fees. So number six, from the, so from, the mom, from that moment, God banished them from the garden and he put a barrier up so they could no longer eat from the tree of life, ensuring that the law of sin and death would take hold and that one day Adam and Eve would surely die. In those days, man did evil all the time. And if it had not been for one righteous man named Noah, mankind would have been wiped off the face of the earth. In those days, if you begin to read some of the beginning of the Bible, there were, everybody was running around and evil was rampant. 
And, and this just goes to show you how graceful of a God that we serve and how big his grace is because he loves us so much and values us so much above all of the other things that he created that all God had to do was just find one guy that was doing good and say, you know what, heck, I'll use him. Everybody else on the face of the world was full of evil and there was one guy named Noah. And God said, you know what, it's time to hit the reset button on the world. And because this one man is righteous, I choose instead of wiping everybody out because he was so angry at that moment you read God was so disappointed in man but just one righteous person and God said you know what I'll use that one person to save everybody well not not everybody but to start over so I put this like this what number am I on six So it wouldn't have been for Noah, one righteous man named Noah, mankind would have been wiped out. God has always desired a relationship with his most valued creation, and because of his grace, he used one man to start over. So number seven, after Noah, God began to teach mankind his will. This is a little different. It was after the, the reset and after people began to populate the earth again, God began to teach mankind his will. He used imperfect people to do incredible things. He first used Abraham. But in order to deal with mankind's sin problem, he would use a man named Moses. Following years of slavery, number eight, following years of slavery, the Jews in Egypt began to cry out to God for help. And God sent Moses to rescue them. Moses, like us, had many reasons why he couldn't be used by God, but God called him and equipped him. You may think that there are many reasons why God can never use you to do something great, but with God on your side, nothing that he wants to do through you will be impossible. So God uses Moses, who is an imperfect guy, who has a speech impediment, who doesn't even want to be used, who tells God, listen, God, there's got to be somebody else that you can get to do this. God said, no, I called you Moses. So number nine, through a series of plagues, God punished Pharaoh for not releasing the Jews. This culminated in a horrific plague that would kill the firstborn child of every person in Egypt, including Pharaoh's firstborn child. God was about to demonstrate his wrath and his grace on epic proportions. I should say maybe in epic proportions. The event that followed is called the Passover. And this one event would shape the way that God demonstrated his grace in the future through his son, Jesus. Make sure you write in the Passover because that's so important. Number 10. Really? On the night before the Passover, God instructed the Jews to kill a lamb. The lamb chosen for this sacrifice had to be without defects. Instructions were given to, well, on what to do with every part of the lamb, but the most important part was the blood. The blood of the lamb represented its life. They were to take the blood and smear it on the doorframe of every household that believed in God. Thank you, Jesus. Later that night, God would send a death angel to kill every firstborn child. And when the death angel came to a household with the blood of the lamb on the doorframe, it would pass over that house saving them from the punishment of the Egyptians. Hundreds of years later, Jesus would come to earth and take on the place 
of that lamb. So I want to pause here for a minute and elaborate on what's going on in Scripture at this time. The Jews have been... We're going to get through this. At least it's bringing some type of humor to this today. The Jews have been in ca captivity. And up until this moment, there wasn't really anything to deal with man's sin. Up until this moment, God didn't use, basically mankind had to deal with their own sin. And that was a punishment that they dealt with, just the weight and burden of their own sin. But up until this moment, God said, okay, we're going to fix this issue temporarily in time. And we're going to use a lamb as a sacrifice. And, and believe me, if you go into scripture, which I think I highlighted in the back of this, there is a lot of different things that God told them to do with that lamb. I mean, every little intricate part of it had a purpose and had a reason. But from this moment on, something changed when it came to sin. God, from this moment on, would, would use a sacrifice and the killing of an innocent animal to cover up people's sin problems. So this was the beginning of that. And as you can see, this, this little one event foreshadows hundreds of years later in time about what Jesus did for us. So to kind of fill in that gap there in, verse, in, in number 11, all throughout the Old Testament, prophets prophesied about the Messiah. Years would pass, but finally God would use a virgin to bring forth the prophesied Messiah, and his name was Jesus. Jesus lived a sinless life, and just remove the word and there, becoming the Lamb of God without defect. He would become the sacrifice for our Passover. He would be beaten and hung from a cross in order that his blood would be shed. This blood, the blood of Jesus, would not be applied like in the Old Testament to a door frame, but instead it would be applied to every person that believes and follows him. The blood of Jesus covers our, the blood of Jesus covers our sin and saves us from the law of sin and death. That law that was created all the way back in the garden. So no longer are we banished from his presence like in the garden. No longer do we carry the burden of sin. When God looks at a person who has accepted Jesus, he does not see their sin. He sees the blood of Jesus that has been applied to their life. So we see an Old Testament principle a hundred years later illustrated through the life of Jesus that came to the earth. So number 12, we might say that we love somebody so much that we would die for that person, but that is rarely a reality that we face. God loves us so much that he demonstrated this kind of love. He was not caught off guard by Adam and Eve's sin. He didn't go retreat into his God space and go, oh my God, I can't believe these people sinned. He wasn't caught off guard by their sin, but yet he made a way for that relationship in the garden to be restored. He has taken every sin that you have committed along with every sin that you will ever commit and placed it onto Jesus. Jesus took the burden of that sin to the cross. And there is no greater love than a person that would lay down their life for a friend. Jesus is the answer to our sin. Sin has no more power over us, and Satan has been defeated. So stop giving him power by doing your will. Instead, pursue the will of God in your life. Number 13, you may not know what God wants from you. In fact, you may be asking God, what do you want me to do? These are not dumb questions. And so many believers struggle with these exact same questions every day. The problem is, is that a lot of believers are comfortable with just knowing that God loves them and God has saved them. Very few believers pursue a deeper relationship that involves commitment and obedience. 
Let these questions fuel your devotion to God. Let them burn into, in you until you experience what it's like to be used by God. The road ahead is not easy, but it's very meaningful. And number 14. After God saved the Jews from Egypt, he spent the rest of the Old Testament teaching people his ways. This endeavor was jump-started with God giving Moses the Ten Commandments. And the book of Judges displays the struggle Israel had in following God. They would do good for a while and then fall back to their old ways. And every time they cried out to God, he would save them. Then time would go on, gone by, and they would forget what God has done. Don't be like them. Follow God with your whole heart and learn his ways. Watch him come through in your life time and time again. And when you experience pain, don't get mad at God. Learn from it. Remember that God loves you and that he wants to use you to do great things. And at the end, it definitely says, complete, make sure this is all completed and return this to the information booth so that you can get lesson two. And now for just a moment, I want to just elaborate. My son, the other day in preparing for our A2C group, um, we were cooking breakfast. And if you're ever a part of an A2C, A2C group during the time that we're out of the church, um, our home is the best home to be in, okay? So, uh, because we, uh, we, we hook people up with a big fat breakfast, all right? Uh, <laughs> our home's the home to be in but uh anyway and, and and mr tribble robert tribble and tiffany who aren't here today but they uh they always bring like biscuits and gravy over man we have tons of bacon and eggs and all that well well i was preparing bacon and while i'm over there at the oven my son comes up to me and and he's like grabbing my leg but he's also reaching up for the pot that's on the hot stove and I'm literally over there cooking bacon that's you know sometimes has a tendency to splash everywhere and I'm and I've got my leg like this pinning him up against the cabinet going hey love I need your help like pulling him away from me right now and the thing is is that he doesn't know this but the stove is really hot and I am trying to protect him from something that's really hot now, he didn't touch it because I was able to stop him from touching it. But imagine we move into the other room where we're setting the table to prepare our, our meal or whatever, and we're moving stuff into the other room, but the stove is still hot. And a two-year-old is generally very curious, like we are sometimes, just very curious. And in his head, probably wonders why mom and dad wouldn't allow me to get close to the stove and while we're in the other room, this did not happen, but I just want you to imagine this. While we're in the other room, you hear a scream come from the kitchen because the stove is still hot and a curious two-year-old walks over to it and says, I couldn't touch it earlier when dad was around, but now that dad isn't around, I'm going to see what's going on up there. You know, there would be some pain there. And after you gathered him aside and, and you made sure that the, you know, blister is taken care of or whatever like that there would be something that you would want to do to make sure that that doesn't happen again would you not you would you would actually take extra precautions the next time that you walk away from a hot stove to make sure that that doesn't happen again and I want you to get this especially if you're listening to my voice through this process sin is like the hot stove a lot of times, the things that you hear that you shouldn't do, or a lot of times the, the, the things that even sometimes the, the church stands against, those things we stand against for a reason. And the reason that we say that these things, or the reason that we say that God said that you, could, you, you shouldn't do these things, isn't because that we want to control people's life, isn't because we, we just want to say you can't do that a lot of times 
God understands the consequences behind sin and the repercussions of sin. And a lot of times he wants to safeguard you from that, which is the main reason why he said that Adam and Eve could eat of everything and play of everything in the garden, but don't touch this one tree. He knew the repercussions of what would happen if they ate from the tree. And oftentimes in our life, those repercussions will play out if we do them, but it's not that God wants to play a game with you because he doesn't want you doing certain things. It's just that he knows what the repercussions of sin are, and he knows that they will cost you greatly. So honestly, I'm tired of competing with the rain. Let's stand up. Let's close this message. So let's bow our heads as we close. I want to pray a prayer. Father God, I, I, I tried to, in this one lesson, to tie the gap between the Old Testament with the New Testament and how you literally went out of your way to have a relationship with us. You, you did so many things. You, you graciously forgave. You graciously provided a way for man to do sacrifices to cover sin in those days. And today we stand here knowing that you even took a further step and sent your son to this earth so that our sins could be forgiven. So I pray that if this is a person's first time to ever make a decision to follow you, I pray, God, if there is somebody that's listening to my voice that has rededicated their life, I pray that they would be moved by how much you have gone out of your way to have a relationship with them. And I pray that they would look at sin differently. They wouldn't look at sin as a, as a rule that says you can't do this. But instead, they would see it as a way that you've safeguarded us from death. So many times when sin plays out in our life, we have to deal with the repercussions of it. And though, and though every person has fallen short, and though every person at their best righteousness is like filthy rags, there's not one of us that stands here that is sinless. I pray that this relationship with you would be something that we pursue with all of our heart. There is no other way of having this relationship. There is no half-hearted way of living for you. It is the most important decision that anybody could ever make. And that's why we emphasize living with you for with our whole heart it's amazing how we put our passions to things in this world and if we would just put a, a, just a little bit of that passion towards following you and researching your scripture and learning about you and knowing how much you love us then we would be able to dedicate our life to this cause and then there would be people that we know and we work with and that are part of our family that could be saved from the grip of hell and instead experience life and, e and eternity in heaven. So I pray, God, put in, with us, put in us a passion to jumpstart this decision today with our whole heart. Don't let us get weary of, of learning. Don't let us get weary of the questions that we don't know the answers to. But let us pursue those and do our own research, God. Let's be relentless in our pursuit 
of knowledge and understanding. I pray that you would work on the hearts of this person that's hearing this for the first time today. And I pray, God, that you would allow them to stay accountable to this process so that we can encourage them. Because we all need encouragement at times. So I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for what you've done for us. Thank you for the path that's led us back to your presence. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Everybody give God a hand clap this morning, church. For two reasons, because he's good and because it's not raining anymore. Amen. Yes, sir. Can we pray for a new building? Absolutely. Along with that, we need to pray for property. Let's, let's, like, I want y'all to join me in this, all right? So don't just listen to me pray. I want you to be praying and, and believing with me, too. So uh, do you want to lead, Mark? Are you comfortable with that? Just, oh, your voice. Okay, I'll, I'll do it then. Okay. So join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for... Uh, for what you've already given us we're very grateful for it that's what we want to say first but also lord we pray that you would provide the finances and the ability it doesn't even have to be the finances we pray that you would use somebody to open up a door so that we could become so that we can get some type of property or new building whatever your will is for us as we move forward we pray god that you would leverage what we've done in order to build your kingdom more here in this area, Father. So provide the finances or provide the door to be open. Whatever it is, God, your will be done in this circumstance, but we're literally asking you, Father, to do this. Please bring us a building of our own so that we don't have to deal with this anymore and so that we don't have to move out twice a year anymore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give God another hand clap. Yeah. I'm down with that. Okay. Good deal. That's right. God bless you guys. Y'all are dismissed. Thank you. And thank you.